afternoon again and welcome to Cracking the Lens, exploiting HTTP's hidden attack surface. Have you ever seen a tempting target but had to ignore it because it's not quite within the scope of your test? Or maybe you saw something that is within scope but it's just not very interesting looking and not worth wasting any time on. Load balancers and analytic systems are everywhere but they're just a bit boring. They form a lens in front of websites that we're used to looking through rather than at. In this session, I'll share with you proven techniques to hunt these systems down, crack them open, and use them as gateways into our target's infrastructure. Some of these techniques involve requests so malformed that they break certain hacker tools and may exploit systems that you never even realized existed. Right at the start of this research, I wrote a simple payload that was designed to make vulnerable systems send a ping back, back to my server. And I sent that payload to a couple of thousand sites and I got quite a few ping backs. But there was something slightly strange about a few of them. I noticed the ping backs coming from cloud.mail.ru and imga.com were coming from the same IP address, which was a bit weird because you wouldn't think that they would be on shared hosting. And so I did a reverse DNS lookup on this mysterious IP address and found that it belonged to my own ISP, which is even stranger. Bearing in mind that this can't be caused by some kind of caching solution because they're clearly doing dynamic processing of my input or they wouldn't have been exploited. And so I took the request that's in the payload and I resent it a few times in the repeater and I noticed that the response from cloud.mail.ru was coming back to me in about 52 milliseconds, which is suspiciously fast for a request that's supposedly going from me in England to the server in Russia, and then all the way to the pingback server in Ireland, and then all the way back again. And so I decided to do a couple of trace routes. The one on the left simulates a HTTP connection, because it's a trace route to port 80. And as you can see, this connection is never getting onto the actual internet. It's being terminated inside my ISP. Whereas the HTTPS connection goes all the way to where the server is actually located in Russia. You can see that on the right. And that is even more suspicious because it suggests that the person who's doing the interception doesn't have their HTTPS secret keys that would enable them to actually intercept HTTPS safely and without notifying the user. So it means this interception is going on probably without the permission or knowledge of cloud.mail.ru. And also, I found that this was affecting uh, not only me at work, but also on my home connection. So this was affecting all consumer and commercial users of BT Broadband. BT Broadband being the largest ISP in England by quite a long way. And I investigated this further and I found out what the purpose of this system was and I found out that I could potentially hijack the system using the vulnerability in it and make alterations to the traffic of millions of BT users, which would be kind of cool. But that's just a distraction from the question that we should be asking, which is given that for many years, I and many other British pen testers have been doing security audits through an exploitable proxy system without ever realizing it. What else have we missed? There was one other suspicious thing about this server, uh, which was that the reverse DNS was off to predator.alien.bt.co.uk, which doesn't exactly suggest this is a friendly kind of system. So, First, I'll talk about how to build a speculative attack pipeline that lets us efficiently hunt these systems down and initiate a conversation with them. After that, I'll describe two key types of attacks, one focused on targeting front-end systems like reverse proxies by making them miss route requests, and one focused on targeting back-end systems like analytic systems where we have to be a bit more inventive to actually get to a useful exploit. After that, I'll do a brief demo of one of the tools I'll be releasing, and then wrap up and take five minutes of questions. The systems that we'll be targeting are designed to remain invisible, and as such, the process of finding and interacting with them is really important. Otherwise, you just won't f even find these systems. For the purpose of this research, 
I sent payloads designed to make vulnerable servers send a DNS or HTTP query back to my server. This approach to finding vulnerabilities has been so effective in recent years that my boss recently coined an acronym for it to try and get more attention to it. So we call it OAST, Out of Band Application Security Testing. And if I use that acronym, now you know what I mean. It's just trying to find a vulnerability by sending a payload that will cause a ping back. At the start of this research, I had absolutely no idea if anything was actually going to work. And as such, I injected payloads in the laziest way possible. I simply made a burp match and replace rule that put a hard-coded payload in every request that got proxied through burp, and then just browsed some websites. And that found quite a few interesting bits of behavior, but it didn't get me much useful information because it didn't correlate the ping back that my server received with the payload or the request that caused the ping back. So in many cases, I couldn't even tell which website a ping back was coming from. I thought that I could correlate it by looking at the time the request was sent and the time the ping back happened. But that doesn't actually work in many cases. For example, what we've got here is a server that, for some mysterious reason, has decided to ping me once every 24 hours. And it just it kept doing that for days. And I was never able to find out what caused that behavior, what system that was, or actually get anywhere useful with that. So to fix this issue, I wrote Collaborator Everywhere, which is an open source burp suite extension, which injects a number of unique pingback payloads into every request being proxied through burp. And it uses those to automatically co correlate the request with the response, uh, with the pingback. So even if you get a pingback 12 hours after you send the payload, it will still be able to link those together for you and give you some information that's actually useful. Now, that tool worked pretty well. It found about half the vulnerabilities that I'm going to show you in this presentation. But I noticed that on one site, it was only finding an issue intermittently. And that was because they were using round robin DNS to point me to one of their five front end load balances. And only one of their load balances was vulnerable. So when you're targeting front end systems, you, you need to bear in mind that you need to hit all of the systems rather than just an arbitrary one. Uh, and to do that, I switched to using mass scan and then in, eventually switched to using ZGrab, which is basically mass scan but with more useful features for sending attacks to websites. So if you want to do a focused manual audit on a specific site, Collaborator Everywhere is the best tool for the job. But if you want to send payloads to thousands of different websites and sp spray them over someone's entire infrastructure, ZGrab is the way to go. So who did I target? Well, I targeted everyone that I could legally target, which means every site that has a bug bounty program that doesn't forbid automated testing. And to identify them, I manually reviewed every single program on HackerOne and BugCrowd, uh, which was quite boring. But at the end of that, uh, I had a spreadsheet from which I could generate a regular expression that would match any domain name that was within the scope of any bounty program that I could legally test. I then combined that regex with Rapid7's project sonar database of all known host names. And by combining those two, I had a short list of three million hosts that I could send payloads to that were all within scope of bug bounties. And I hadn't actually had to send any requests or do any DNS lookups myself. Uh, that resolved to about 50,000 active web servers. I initially populated this list of targets also using reverse DNS lookups, uh, but I ran into a little bit of a problem with that. The problem is that Google has got a bug bounty program. And some websites, for whatever reason, like to spoof Google's reverse DNS. They like to pretend to be Google. I'm not entirely sure why they do this, but the result is that if you, use, if you trust reverse DNS, you will end up sending payloads to people who are probably not expecting you to send payloads to them and might not be too happy about it. Now, you could argue that they're asking for it <laughs> by making that reverse DNS set up, but I wouldn't recommend that overall. Now, if you're going to send a request to 50,000 web servers, you might as well make sure that it's optimized to hit as much attack surface as possible. One way to do that is using the no transform directive for the cache control header, which instructs systems like reverse proxies not to rewrite the request in any way, 
before passing it along, because that might break the payload that you're sending. Also, you could try resending your payloads, but using the X forwarded proto header to pretend that you're using a protocol other than the one that you're really using, uh, which can also just cause unexpected scenarios and let you hit code paths that most people never touch. The end result of the setup was that during this research, whenever I had an idea for a new type of technique, I could spend a couple of minutes uh, writing a HTTP request manually with that payload in it, and then use ZGRAB to send that to 50,000 web servers in the space of about five minutes and just collect the results. That capability to quickly try out ideas and then iteratively improve them is a large part of the reason why this research was so successful. Okay, that's enough about the tooling. Uh, now for some exploits. So first of all, we're going to target things that sit in front of the application and we're going to try and trick them into routing requests to internal services. This is services that are meant to be private. So this is a type of server-side request forgery, but it's a lot more powerful than your, than, than, than your run-of-the-mill SSOF. That's because we've got, generally, here, we've got a huge amount of control over the request that we're sending to the internal service, which makes it much easier to exploit internal services, as we'll see shortly. The simplest way to make your request get misrouted is simply to change the host header to where you want the request to get routed to. This approach works on an amazing number of sites. Now, this technique is publicly known in some locations, but it's hugely underappreciated. I can say that with confidence because using my pipeline that I just mentioned, in the space of five minutes, I was able to exploit 27 different Department of Defense servers a couple of Yahoo load balancers, my own ISP by accident, and also a Colombian ISP <laughs> that threw itself into the firing line by doing DNS poisoning on one of my targets. So let's take a look at what the impact of this very simple mishap can be. Here, I'm sending a request to one of Yahoo's load balancers, and I'm using the host header to trick them into routing it to port 8082 on on a, on a nearby IP. So the service I'm accessing that you can see in the response is not publicly accessible. Now, judging by the repeated unknown command lines in the response, this service is not talking HTTP. It's using some kind of line-based protocol and is therefore interpreting every HTTP header as a separate command. Other than that, I had no real idea uh, what the system was, but I, I had an, an idea to find out. I changed the HTTP method from get to help. And amazingly, that actually worked. <laughs> so the service was, was like, hi, uh, I'm, I'm an Apache traffic overseer, which means I'm responsible for distributing the configuration of probably a large number of Yahoo's front-end load balancers. And also, here's how you can change configuration settings on me. <laughs> now, note that if this was normal server-side request forgery, it would be impossible to exploit this service because to get and set commands, we need to send requests that have white space in them, and you can't do that with a normal server-side request forgery. But because we can send pretty much whatever request we like, it's actually pretty easy to exploit this system. So here you can see at the top, I'm saying, what is the value of proxy.config.alarm email? And they're like, hey, yep, uh, that's set to nobody at yahooinc.com. <laughs> Perfect. And by setting variables, I could potentially whitelist my own external IP address to give me permission to push items into their cache and overwrite items in all of their caches, uh, which would give me the ability to deface a good number of Yahoo services. Also, I could enable SOX proxying on all of their load balances, uh, thereby giving me full IP level access to their internal network, which would be pretty nice. A disadvantage with that approach is that it would also give everybody else full TCP IP access to their network, uh, which would make things pretty short-lived, I think. I reported this issue to Yahoo uh, and got a $15,000 payout for it. So that was pretty cool. And I found this issue using, thank you. <laughs> There's more where that came from. I, I, f I found this issue using Collaborator, Collaborator Everywhere. 
And when I made that, and I fixed it pretty fast. <laughs> uh, and when, when I made that pipeline that I mentioned a couple of weeks later, I found another server with the same vulnerability. So I got another 5,000 for that, for 20,000 total, uh, which was a really good start to this research. As mentioned, the same technique also worked on my ISP. And I could use it to make this set of proxy servers route my request to their own administration interface. And if I could brute force the password on that, or, or it was using default credentials, uh, they don't have a bug bounty program, so I, I, don't, I don't actually know if they were. Uh, I, could, I could use rewrite rules to like, do, rewrite the requests of millions of BT users, which would be quite nice. But what I really wanted to know was, what is the point of this interception system? What is, what is it doing? And to try and find out, I did a trace route of the whole IPv4 space with a TTO of 10, which meant the packet never left my ISP's infrastructure. And that showed me that roughly 5% of website IP addresses had been blacklisted and would be routed into this proxy system. There's an interesting side effect to that, which is that if your website's IP address is on this blacklist, perhaps because you're just using cloud hosting uh, and you've got no control over what IP addresses you're on, uh, all traffic from all BT users, which is the majority of England, is going to come from about five IP addresses. And that means if you're doing any IP-based authentication, it's going to fail horribly. And also, if you decide to IP ban any of these users for bad behavior, you might end up banning a substantial part of England, uh, which wouldn't be much good. Anyway, after your traffic, if, if your request is to one of these blacklisted IPs, it gets routed into this pool of proxies. And then they apply a blacklist of host names. And if you're trying to access a dodgy host name like icefilms.info, you see this message, which I'm sure none of the upstanding English people in the audience have ever seen before. It says, access to the websites listed on this page has been blocked pursuant to orders of the high court. Although, of course, it's pretty easy to bypass. So it looks like this system is being used uh, to prevent copyright infringement. But when I reported the admin access vulnerability to BT, I got a little bit of backstory. This system was actually originally built as part of Clean Feed, which is a government initiative to block access to images of child abuse. It's just that after it was made, it was quickly repurposed to target copyright abuse. A while later, I sent a payload to a different Russian application, this time it was vk.com, and once again got a ping back from an unexpected location. This time it was from a Colombian ISP called Metrotel. And because they're not my ISP, I knew that to get my payload to go to their server, they had to have done DNS poisoning. And I was using Rapid7's DNS database. So I contacted Rapid7, and they helpfully identified the responsible DNS server, and then uh, I did lookups for the Alexa top million through this server to figure out who they were targeting. That showed that they were mostly focused on image hosts and social networks. And if you try to hit some of those, uh, you would get, once you would just get blocked and it would say, access to this has been blocked due to images of child abuse along with this logo here. However, <laughs> once again, that's not all this system was for. Because they were also poisoning the DNS for bbc.co.uk which is a news website. And I don't think you'll find many dodgy images on that site, which raises the question of why they want to route all traffic to that site through their proxies. Unfortunately, finding out why is quite difficult. They weren't doing any kind of uh, injection or rewriting on all, all requests, as far as I could tell. So they're either targeting specific articles and maybe blocking access to or changing the content of those, or maybe they're just passively watching. Maybe they simply want to know which articles on the BBC you're actually reading so they can pass that information along to someone. Now, although the payload that I've shown you is really very simple, thinking you can reliably predict what will happen when you send that payload is always a mistake. I found seven Yahoo servers that would take the host header that I gave, in this case vcap.me, and they would route the request to outage that host header. And they would also put the host in the path twice. Now, I've, I've got no idea what the point of that is, uh, but luckily all I need to know is how to exploit it. And as presented there, it's not much use, right? Because you're, you're just going to get a 404 from whatever internal server you hit. 
Fortunately, this, the vulnerable service that was rewriting the request was incredibly tolerant of what you put in the host header. So if you sent the following host header, it would rewrite it as you see on the right. And that request, when the backend server gets it, will get normalized into a request to the web route. So we can actually fetch pretty much arbitrary stuff using this technique. Uh, that got an, another 5,000 off Yahoo. To be honest, I, I'm not sure why the bounty values from Yahoo varied so much. They seemed to be a, a little bit random, but the, the total amount was a good amount of money, so I'm not really complaining. Anyway, uh, the, the moral of this issue is that on your, on your server that's receiving pingbacks, you need to use wildcard DNS to make sure that you receive everything that's being triggered by your payloads. Now, this request may look familiar. Uh, I used it back in 2013 to poison Django's password reset emails. But here I found a certain uh, US military server which would route the request to wherever I specified in the request line. So I think they had a white list of acceptable hosts, but the request line takes priority. However, I had a little bit of an issue here, which is that I wanted to prove I could access an internal service to show that this issue had some kind of severity, but I was too nervous to do a proper internal port scan on a Department of Defense server. So instead, I decided to Google a bit and see if I could find anything useful. And I found an amazing forum post on defensivecarry.com. It says, if you're looking at this and are not in the military or DOD, then this won't mean anything to you, nor will you be able to access it. And then it linked a couple of internal Department of Defense websites. And sure enough, using this technique, I could access them. So that was handy. Uh, I think the moral here is, number one, uh, if you can av avoid doing a port scan of someone's internal network, uh, I would recommend doing so. People can get quite t twitchy about that. Uh, Yahoo certainly did. And also, uh, the larger the target company, the less likely it is that you'll actually need to, because people are just leaking tons of useful stuff online. Now, although the network diagram only shows one proxy server, it's possible that, well, some people like to chain proxy servers. And if you want to target the server in the middle of a chain, that can make life a bit difficult, because your payload is likely to get rejected by the first proxy in the chain. For example, in Capsula, uses the host header to work out which of their clients to route requests onto. So if you try the normal payload that I showed at the start, it will just get dropped. Fortunately, Encapsula is incredibly tolerant about what they allow in the host header. Basically, they ignore everything that comes after the colon in the request. So you can send a request like the one shown there, and Encapsula will route it onto the target, and then the target, or a particular target that I found in this case, would rewrite that as a URL, uh, like so, and it would end up getting routed to wherever I chose. So even though that target had Encapsula in front of it, with a bit of creativity, you can get around that and still get your server-side request forgery. This had a slightly cool side effect, which is because the payload caused the back end to connect directly to my server, that told me exactly where the back end was. And from that point, I could speak directly to the back end and just, and just avoid Encapsula entirely. So although this isn't strictly a vulnerability in Encapsula, it's still probably something they might want to think about fixing. These vulnerabilities aren't just caused by misconfigurations. What we've got here is some code that New Relic had on their main, uh, on, on their main official website. And, well, it probably looks absolutely fine to you. Uh, it, it does to me, too, to be honest. <laughs> uh, it just takes the user-supplied URL and it overwrites the host and the port specified in that URL with a hard-coded one of the internal server that they want to route your request to. Unfortunately for New Relic, they were using the Apache HTTP components library for their server. And this server fails to require that paths start with a forward slash. So that means if you send a malformed illegal HTTP request like that, then their code rewrites it like that. And once again, they're accessing a server of my choice uh, with a username of backend server. So this got me access to New Relic's internal network, uh, which had some amazing stuff on it. Uh, for a start, it had some incredible developer in-jokes, uh, such as this page, which was blasting out music and had marquees and everything. They also had some administration panels with no authentication on them. 
uh, which was cool. Now, unfortunately, New Relic don't pay cash bounties, uh, but to their credit, they patched this issue really quite fast on a public holiday, and they also reported this problem with uh, this problem back to Apache HTTP components, where it's now been fixed. So if you're using that library, then you don't need to be panicking right now as long as you're using the latest version of it. Fortunately for me, this technique also worked on 17 different Yahoo servers, uh, so I got another $8,000. Now, uh, that made a total of, of uh, 33000 which is how much I earned uh, in bounties during this research. And you might be wondering uh, what, what happened to that money. Now, when I started this research, I had a deal with my company that any bounties I owned would get spent on beer. <laughs> However, we're, quite, we're a fairly small company, and spending $33,000 on beer uh, was looking like it was going to be quite challenging. Uh, so we gave the majority to charity and spent a small amount of it on beer. Thanks. So possibly the strangest behavior that I saw during this research was courtesy of a website called, called GlobalLeaks, which is a bit like WikiLeaks, except actually legitimate. And so what I found with these guys was if I sent them uh, the following uh, HTTP request, which is malformed because it doesn't start with a forward slash, uh, then I got about 15 DNS lookups, all in mixed case, coming from different IP addresses. Uh, which is definitely not what I expected to happen. Now, eventually, due to the nature of the site and the fact that all the IP addresses the lookups were coming from were different, I had an idea as to what the cause of this behavior might be. Because this is a whistleblowing website, they want to hide the physical location of their backend server to, to, to stop like, governments from raiding it and that kind of stuff. So they connect to it as a Tor hidden service. So what I've got is server-side request forgery through Tor, which is, uh, is quite interesting from an exploitation perspective. So it going through Tor is the reason that all, all the IP addresses of the lookups are different. They're coming from different exit nodes. And also, the mixed-case DNS lookups are the result of a fairly obscure mechanism that Tor uses to try and increase the entropy in DNS by making the requests mixed-case. So the impact of this is hard to qualify because I can't access their internal network. It's definitely server-side request forgery, but I'm accessing whatever I try and access through Tor. What I can do, though, uh, is get a decent expansion of attack surface because I can make their client, their Tor client, connect directly to my server. And if I've got a vulnerability for a Tor client, then that could be quite useful. Also, I could potentially use it to obscure and attack on a target because I can use them as a hop and make them route my payload through Tor to my target. And that means even if the attack gets traced backwards through Tor, uh, they'll just end up looking at this highly suspicious GlobalLeaks website that probably doesn't keep any logs and won't be able to figure out that it was me. All right, uh, now let's talk about exploiting helper systems. Uh, unlike misrouting attacks, with helper systems, uh, causing pingbacks is often really easy, but uh, exploiting the systems in a meaningful way can be quite hard. That's because server-side request forgery found in backend systems is normally blind, which means we can't see the result from the internal request we've triggered, which means we can't adapt our attacks based on what we're seeing. This research started on a really old website that had an amazing sentence on it. It said, the XWAP profile header should contain a URL pointing to an XML document that specifies the features of a mobile device. So it specifies the specification gives you two amazingly high-risk pieces of functionality. One, you've got to fetch a user-supplied URL. Two, you've got to parse the resulting untrusted XML file. And I immediately tried this out on a bunch of websites, uh, but it didn't work on any of them, uh, sadly, probably because it's so old. So I just tweeted it. And then, I got a ping back from Facebook. <laughs> it turns out Facebook does support this, but they fetch the URL you supply about 26 hours after you send the request. Fortunately, uh, their implementation of this uh, and their XML parsing seems to be secure as far as I can tell, although the fact there was a 26-hour time lag between each attack 
uh, made it really tedious. So it, I might have missed something. So if you want to try and hack that, feel free. Fortunately, there are many other useful ways to trigger pingbacks from helper systems that are actually effective, uh, are widely supported. The referrer header is the most popular one. A, f a huge number of websites, you will not believe how many websites do this, uh, will fetch whatever URL you specify in the referrer header. I'm not 100% sure why they're doing it, but I assume it's for some kind of analytics purpose. So that's probably the most effective way of triggering pingbacks and backend systems, uh, but also you'll be familiar with the XFORDED4 header. You've probably used it to spoof your IP. It also supports host names. And if you specify a host name in there, then you can use the fact that you did or didn't receive a DNS lookup for that host name to work out whether they're trusting this header and therefore whether it's worth using exploits that try and take advantage of this. And similarly, uh, the slightly more obscure variants, true client IP and XVL IP, can be used in exactly the same way. Also, for some reason, uh, Encapsula uh, will fetch any URL that you specify, provided that you specify it with the same parameter name twice. <laughs> I have no idea why they're doing that. I only found it by accident because a bug in my code meant that URL parameters got specified twice. And I don't know if it's exploitable because they don't have a bug bounty program, so I'm not allowed to actually try and find out. Uh, but there you go. So say that a site is fetching the URL specified in the referrer header. Uh, so what? What can you do? Well, one option is to try an off-the-shelf exploit. For example, you can make them connect to your server and run Responder on your server, which is a wonderful piece of code that tries to trick connecting clients into leaking credentials to your server. I, I tried this out on all of my targets. It didn't work on any of them, but while I was trying it out, some random guy with a vulnerability scanner hit my server and did get exploited. Uh, so I still count that as a kind of win. You can also try out a pacemaker, uh, which, is an, which is a Python fake SSL server that tries the, the lesser used client heart bleed attack on connecting clients. And that did work on one of my targets. So on a site that I had blind server-side request forgery on, I was able to make them connect to my server and read a memory from their back end, which was quite cool. Also, uh, you, can do, you can use tools like POF uh, to do TCP IP fingerprinting and the like. But that's a bit boring, right? Off-the-shelf exploits only get you so far. What else can you do? Well, you can do more OAST. So you will have found this behavior using a pingback technique, but that doesn't mean you have to stop using those techniques. Uh, you can take the latest struts to remote code execution of the week and rewrite the exploit so it triggers a pingback, and then make their referrer crawler spray that payload across their own internal network, and maybe you'll get some shells. Even better, some of these clients that fetch the referrer render the page that they fetch using phantom JS or the like. And that means that we can make them spray a cross-site scripting payload across their own internal network. And if that works, then we can I inject a beef hook onto that site, and we've got full access, like persistent access to an internal website, which is pretty nice. So I've decided to dub this blind reflected server-side XSS. Also, depending on uh, how they implement uh, cross-protocol access <laughs> restrictions in this uh, thick client that they're rendering pages with, you could potentially get XSS in local files, like Procself in Viron. That can mean, if you can pull that off, uh, that can mean that you can potentially use JavaScript in a local file like that to read files from their file system on their server, which is once again pretty nice. In fact, if they're rendering, there are loads of interesting things and loads of questions that it raises. For example, do they even enforce the same origin policy? Because some of them don't. And that means you can basically use them as a permanent proxy with the right JavaScript code. Also, maybe you can open a pop-up that subsequently won't get closed, giving yourself persistent JavaScript execution on their server. And you know, what plugins do they support? That could be interesting. To answer these questions, my colleague Gareth Hayes wrote a tool called Hackability. This is a website that you can connect to in a browser or anything that will render a web page, and it will perform tests to try and answer these questions for you. It will show you the answers visually, and it will also uh, 
uh, trigger requests to the server. So even if this is a blind server-side request forgery vulnerability that you've got, you can just look in your server logs and see what the results of these tests are. Uh, with this particular example, I've pointed parity at this, uh, which is the second most popular Ethereum client. Uh, most notable because last week someone hacked it and stole $30 million worth of Ethereum using it. Uh, and it integrates into your web browser. And what Hackability has spotted here is some interesting objects in the JavaScript environment. So these are objects that are not present in a normal browser environment, which strongly suggests that Parity itself has injected them. And sure enough, using those, you can do things like you can get the current user's uh, Ethereum wallet ID and potentially see what balance they have in that wallet and also initiate transactions and other kinds of interesting stuff. Okay, time for one final exploit. This one's my favorite. I've, I've kept the best till last. Here, I sent that payload that I showed you right at the start, uh, but the request didn't get misrouted. It got routed correctly. But several seconds after I sent it, I received some attempts to re request certain resources from my server. And I confirmed if I try to load a history of blimps page on this military website, uh, I've anonymized this slightly, uh, then the server would try to grab a picture of a blimp from my server, uh, which is pretty weird. I wonder if we can exploit that. It's obvious that, well, the only explanation for this is that there's some kind of reverse proxy, some kind of caching reverse proxy that's scanning responses from the application, looking for resource import statements like image source equals, and is then fetching those, presumably so it can cache it. So maybe I can send a request to the application that triggers a response to me that makes the reverse proxy fetch an internal URL that I don't have access to and cache the response, and then I can just grab it out the cache. Hopefully. So I found some, some normal reflected XSS in the target, and I used it to inject the, the following response. So from the proxy's point of view, this is definitely a static image import. I'm using the image source equals statement, and the file name ends in a.jpg. But from the backend server's point of view, uh, this is a request to the root of a PHP application. So the proxy saw that response that I injected through XSS, they fetched that URL and they cached it. And then I was able to grab that out of the cache. So the key problem here is that we've just got a proxy that's really enthusiastic. It will cache anything it sees regardless of what domain it's on. And it has no concept of things that should be internally accessible and things that should not. OK, looks like it's time for a brief demo. I'm going to demo collaborator everywhere. So I'm just going to enable that. Uh, <laughs> okay, it, it works. <clears throat> Good. Uh, so you, you can see here uh, it's worked out what my IP address is. Uh, that's because so sometimes when you're browsing, your browser will cause interactions. And if you don't realize that's you causing them, you can get very excited before you found out found out that you haven't really achieved anything whatsoever. So now I'm going to load Firefox, and it's going to ping open a bunch of websites. Please note, I'm not demonstrating vulnerabilities in these websites. I'm just demonstrating interesting behavior in these websites. As far as I know, none of these issues that I'm, none of these websites have exploitable issues. I mentioned Facebook, but that one's going to happen in 26 hours' time, so you're not actually going to see that one. So if we look, in burp, then you can see that's the normal request that the browser sent, but Collaborator Everywhere has rewritten it, and it's injected a lot of payloads. Uh, it's called Collaborator Everywhere because it just injects payloads everywhere. And if we look at the target, then we can see that we've got some interactions. So for example, here, Stripe, after two seconds, uh, has fetched the URL specified in the referrer header uh, uh, over there. Uh, and we can see that they're using Ruby. And the next thing to do would be to point that at hackability and work out how, uh, how to exploit it. 
Also, uh, here's one from Netflix. I, I triggered this earlier because there's a nine hour and 30 minute time gap in between you sending uh, you send the payload and them getting the response. Uh, interestingly here, they claim that they're using an iPhone, but they also claim to be using an x86 CPU. Uh, so yeah, I, kn I know which one I believe. Uh, also, we can see uh, some people using the true client IP header, which is less well known. Uh, these guys fetch it after quite a few hours. And interestingly, so these two payloads both come from Starbucks, uh, but they come from completely different servers after a different length of time. So this is giving you a pointer as to a backend system. So as well as being useful information that they support this header, you now know what backend analytics system they're using, and maybe you can just go find their website and exploit that if you're a proper hacker. And similarly, loads of guys use X44. OK. All right, so as far as replicating these issues goes. Uh, you, you, can rec you can replicate them, all of them are using Burp, of course, so I wouldn't have found them. Uh, as of today, there's an update to Burp that will make its scanner aut automatically find all of the, all of the vulnerabilities that I found about. Now, you could replicate these issues using Zap if it wasn't for issue 1318, which I reported to them a few years ago, which means that if you change the host header in Zap, Zap will send that request to the wrong place. Uh, so if you want to use an open source tool, I'd recommend using MITM proxy. Uh, it's extremely leaked looking too. Now, if you want to help your clients replicate these issues, they might not be familiar with any of these tools, so you probably want to give them some kind of uh, shell command. You can use curl to replicate some of these attacks, but the more mal the ones with that are more malformed, the more advanced attacks can't be done using curl. So you'll have to use ncat and then just pipe that uh, you'll, you have to use echo and then pipe that into NCAT or open SSL as appropriate. Also, you may need to use the server name directive with open SSL to set the server name indicator field to make sure that it gets routed to the right place. So, how do you prevent these attacks? Well, as far as the reverse proxy attacks go, I think you just have to acknowledge that reverse proxies are designed to proxy traffic. Uh, so they're going to proxy traffic, and it only takes a tiny bug to make them proxy traffic to the wrong place. As such, they should be put in, inside a demilitarized zone where they don't have access to anything sensitive, where they don't have access to unauthent unauthenticated administration panels. As for crawlers, it may help to think of them as employees with really old web browsers uh, who click on every link that you give them. On the bright side, unlike employees, uh, they won't complain very much if you stick them in a sandbox. So once again, that's what I recommend. As for researchers, what well, I recommend uh, welcoming researchers. If you've got a bug bounty program that's public and allows automated testing, I've probably already tested your site. Uh, so you can have a little bit of peace of mind. So I see a lot of bug bounty programs that forbid automated testing, and I understand they're probably doing that because otherwise they get flooded with traffic by people scanning them with Akinetics and Burp millions of times. So what I'd recommend doing is saying, please don't use off-the-shelf tools on our website, but still allowing the use of custom tools. So the three key takeaways are that bug bounties enable white hat research at scale, load balancers are VPNs for the public, and crawlers are employees who click. I'll take five minutes of questions now, and if you have any more after that, feel free to come and speak to me at the back or send me an email. Uh, don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Thank you for listening.